Hi, my name is Mike Montaigne. I'm the communication coordinator here at the Rock Bible Church. And man, we just want to thank you so much for tuning into our page. If you haven't liked and subscribed to us yet, go ahead and hit that subscribe button down there and subscribe to our page. That way you can get notifications every time that we drop a video. Now, if you live around here in the area, we would love for you to come and check us out here in person. We want to get to know you. I hope this video has blessings upon your life, and I hope you enjoy it. So go ahead, sit back, relax, and listen to the message, and you guys have an amazing day. Man, I'm excited. Week number three of the question series. This is by far my favorite series we do every single uh, year. Um, I really hope it's been encouraging you, pushing you to the gospel, and challenging you to think through your faith. Um, I know uh, the biggest question or biggest challenge I want to put on our church um, is for you, one, to listen to the answers, but to hear the questions, because these questions are coming from you, from your uh, friends, your family. And as we dive into some difficult questions today, um, I hope I hope it challenges your heart to press in, to love those uh, around you. Um, I went a little long last week, so let's go ahead and just jump right in um, and answer the questions, starting with a fun one today. Question number one. What does the Bible have to say about tattoos and body piercings? Whoo, this is a good question. Uh, so we're going to read the only passage in Scripture that talks about tattoos. Um, it says Leviticus 19, verse 28. You must not slash your body for the dead or incise uh, a tattoo on yourself. I am the Lord. Now you may be reading that passage and be like, ha-ha, got him. And so, like... Mike, this is an awkward conversation for you because you're covered in them. Uh, and you may be reading that and instantly going, see, I knew it. But let's just read a few more passages in Leviticus 19. So let's go back just one verse earlier, Leviticus 19, 27. You must not round off the, color, or the corners of your hair on your head or ruin the corners of your beards. Okay, so men... Can't cut your hair. Can't cut your beards. Let's go uh, another verse. Let's go just one more before that. Leviticus 19.26. You must not eat meat uh, with blood still in it. All well done steaks from here on out. Ugh. Might as well just pour ketchup on top of it. Ugh. Let's, let's go a little bit further. Leviticus 19.19. 19, still the same chapter. Says this. Uh, you must not allow two different kinds of animals to breed together. You must not sow your field with two different kinds of seed. You must not wear a garment made of two different types of material. So if we're going to stick with this passage, no labradoodles, uh, no gardens, and really no polyester cotton blend blouses anymore, ladies and gentlemen. I think for us as Christians, church, we need to be really careful not to use the Bible to attack something we don't like while completely ignoring other passages that suit our lifestyle. Time and time again, we like to sit here and say, the Bible says you can't have tattoos, but look at my garden. Look at the tomatoes and cucumbers I made. Look at this wonderful blouse that's polyester and cotton and just a little bit of satin to it. Christians are really, really, really good at justifying their own selfish desires. So let's go back and understand the context of why this passage is here, not just a single verse. See, God made a covenant with Abraham. We know this back in Genesis. He made a covenant with Abraham to create a nation, a holy nation, a nation that was set apart, a people group who is sold out to God that all other nations would look at and go, that is a different nation, a set apart and a holy nation. And so then God establishes rules with this nation, with the Israelite people, hoops in which they must jump through. All these laws God established was to design the, uh, the world to see that this nation, the Israelite people, were different. He established three different types 
of laws. One is a moral law, a law that we are then still bound by. That regardless of what nation you hold to, you are bound to this moral law. And it would be like, thou shall not kill. There are other laws that we see like in this passage, which are Israelite laws, specifically for this nation. Don't eat catfish. Uh, don't eat shrimp. Uh, don't 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 uh, have this or that, and they were set apart for the Israelite people and the Israelite people only. So the entire world will look at them and go, "Wow, that nation is a little bit different. That's definitely set apart." And then there were other laws, the third laws, which would be like priestly laws, and they would be laws in which the pastors and the priests would have to do wear funny hats and weird garments that I'm not going to do. Uh, and so uh, the whole point, though, of these laws was to establish that this Israelite nation was different from the rest. Understand the context. Leviticus 19, 1 and 2 says this, speak to the whole congregation of the Israelites, to this nation, and to tell them, you must be holy, because I, your God, is holy, set apart. And so the situation of cutting yourself for the dead or Uh, the prohibiting of tattoos was not because of touching the skin with a needle was something that was evil. Because if touching the skin with a needle is something that was evil, the nurses would have a difficult job doing their job. It was not that the skin was untouchable and God didn't want us to defame the skin. Rather, it was because these markings were signs of compromise with the surrounding culture who worshipped false idols, most of them pagan prostitution type worship. The moral concern wasn't the skin, but the tattooing, the tattooing may signal um, something in the heart that doesn't fit or align with the holy commitment God's people made during that time period. Now fast forward. To us, believers today, we are not under the old covenant, under those old laws, laws, because that's why I don't wear funny garments when weird hats anymore. But we are under a new covenant. Uh, once we accept Christ, you are a new creation. The old is gone, Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. You are declared righteous, as the New Testament tells us, because Christ lives in you. We are not a holy nation anymore. We are a holy individual. And we then gather as holy individuals into this thing called the church, which is the body of individual holy placed people coming together on a designated day to worship our risen Savior, to find encouragement, to be equipped, and then to fellowship with other people believers. And so, so you may be sitting here, so pastor, are you saying I can cover my head to toe in piercings and tattoos? And, and, and to be honest, I think that's the wrong question. I think the right question is, God, what do you want to do with my life that honors you? From God, what type of seeds do you want me to place in my garden? To God, what type of outfit do you want me to wear? To God, is it okay to get Philippians 1 6 tattooed on my left arm? I think we need to get back to a place as God's people that everything we do should be done to glorify Christ with every step of our lives. And I'll be honest, give me someone who is covered in tattoos and sold out to Christ than someone who doesn't have tattoos and lives for their own desires. And so for, for us, we need to live, as the church, as believers, we need to live a life submitted. We need to live a life surrendered. Not bearing fruit of the Spirit out of obligation or religion, but bearing love, bearing joy, peace, patience, because that's who we are. Because we're set apart. We're different, declared righteous. We are holy because... not. Because we have tattoos or don't have tattoos, but because Christ lives in us. We have been changed. We need to celebrate that our God is still in the saving business. And I think if the church got to a place where we lived a life of holiness, 
in a life led by the Holy Spirit instead of a life of being judgy and bitter people, just maybe, just maybe the world would look at us and go, they're different. There's something different about them. And that's what God wants us to be. So, so can you cover yourselves in tattoos and all those different things? I think the next, the deeper question you need to ask yourself is, um, God, what do you want to do with my life and pray about it? I think you should really pray about it. Now, if you're 18, hear me in this. If you are 18, here's some just wisdom from your pastor. And you're 18 and you're like, oh, I'm getting a tattoo, man, right now. Here's what I would challenge you at 18. Sit on it for a year. Go to a tattoo parlor, pick out your tattoo, and then for a year, put it hanging up in your bathroom and look at it every single day. And on your 19th birthday, when you have looked at that thing for an entire year and you can still live with it, and God says it's good, and you can afford it, that's up to you. But I think many of us in this room would say we have tattoos that we kind of regret. So that's just a word of wisdom uh, from your pastor who may or may not have one. Uh, and so, um, all right, next question. Uh, great question. Thank you for asking. Question number two. In the past, wearing hats inside has always been against baker, basic decorum uh, and good manners. Uh, this has seemed to shift in recent years. Does the Bible have anything to say about men wearing hats inside the church? Another great question, uh, and really kind of sort of lines up with the last question we were talking about, uh, but it adds another layer to it, which is uh, your own personal traditions. Uh, because we all have personal traditions, and we've all been to that church uh, where they go, we've always done it this way, right? And, and really, traditions aren't bad. Traditions are neutral. They can be good or bad, depending on the heart behind it. Uh, if this tradition glorifies Christ and everything it does, then great. Tradition is good. Let's keep it. But if this tradition soothes your own soul and soothes your own heart and your own selfish desires, then that tradition is bad, and we should flee from that tradition. And so a simple answer to this question is no. Your tradition should have no value upon my life. No different than, than churches uh, used to say that you had to dress up and wear a tie and a suit to church and wear your best. That was a tradition established by man because it would be legalism because the Bible doesn't address the wearing of hats. It doesn't address the wearing of suits inside the church. But it does spark a good question because the Bible does talk about head coverings. It's an interesting passage, and it's, it's not one that you would have thought of, but it does talk about how people should and should not wear head coverings in church. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11 deals with this. Now, understand, I do not have the time. As I open this jar in the next few seconds, a bunch of worms are going to spill out. I do not have enough time to solve and answer all these. Um, I'm just going to give you a quick overview and then let you sort the rest of it out. But 1 Corinthians 11, verses 3 through 5, says a really interesting passage. It says, I want you to know that Christ is the head of every man, and that man is the head of every woman, and God is the head of Christ. Any man who prays or prophesies with his head covered disgraces his head. But any woman who prays or prophesies with her head covered, uh, uncovered, disgraces her head. For, if, uh, for it is one and the same thing to having a shaved head. Now pause again. This whole passage is a bunch of worms that I do not want uh, and have time to dive into. But what you need to understand is the context. See, chapter 9 and chapter 10, what Paul was doing was addressing how the world worshipped. How pagans would worship. If it was in modern terms, uh, chapter 9 and chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians, Paul would probably address your football stadiums. Ooh, too harsh? Okay, good. Uh, but he was talking about how the world worshipped. 
And then he says, okay, I just spent the last two chapters talking about how the world worships. Now let's dive in and let's talk about how the church should actually worship and what your worship looks like. And in this passage of 11, 12, 13, and 14, four chapters are dedicated to how we worship. He sits in here, he talks about the spiritual gifts. We talked about this a few weeks ago and how you should use the spiritual gifts within inside the church. He talks about um, uh, communion and how communion should be taken. It's the passage that if you go to any church and at any point in time they take communion, they'll read this passage in this section about how communion should be done. Uh, and then he addresses in this context about how men and women, their roles with inside the church, inside the service. And without going down a massive rabbit trail, Paul is using the, the idea of head coverings to address actually the authority inside a church. Because for some crazy reason, in God's wisdom, he saw it fit that men are to be the head of their homes and the head of the church. Why? Well, it sure ain't because we're smarter, amen? <laughs> the reality is God needs to hold someone accountable. And God chose men. And every lady cheered. Amen? I'll address single parents and uh, parents without fathers in a moment. But I need you to hear this. Our church takes leadership very seriously. Very seriously. I put pressure on men. I put pressure on you men to lead your households well. Because pressure should be placed on you. Because God sees you leading your house, leading your wives, leading your children and men. I need to encourage you, if you do not have men around you who will challenge you, uh, who will encourage you, then you need to find some. And you may sit here and go, well, no one's asked me. Have you asked anyone? I was having a conversation with a, a, one of my closest friends, and uh, he was realizing that he's now getting to being an older man. He hates to admit it, but he is getting to be an older man. And I said, if you're an older man now, who are the younger men that are under you that you're discipling? Every man, someone is probably younger than you that you can start discipling. You need men in your life. And ladies, I would challenge you the same way. You need to have women in your life who are encouraging you and lifting you up. And here's what I would ask for you to start praying. Brittany and I right now have a burden for this. We talk about this often in our household, and we're talking about this concept of launching a sisterhood and a brotherhood for every woman and every man who is a member of our church. Not just attends, a member, because there's perks in memberhood and membership. There are. And we would encourage you. Why? Because we get to hold you accountable. If you're going to hold us accountable, we get to hold you accountable. And so we're talking through this, and all we're asking, I don't have, we don't have, it's all God's still fleshing it out in our hearts right now or praying through it. Uh, I would ask for you to pray for us um, as we think through it. Um, but we need to grow more in the gospel. Um, long story short, to get back to the question and not run off on rabbit trails, um, <clears throat> if you want to wear a hat, wear a hat. Uh, I am more concerned about the status of your heart than what you wear on your head. All right, um, next question. Um, this is my favorite question ever asked. Uh, is our cell phone the mark of the beast? This is really my favorite question of all the three, four years that I've done this. Favorite question ever asked. Uh, because on one hand, it's a little silly. Uh, and we would say, of course not. But on the other hand, maybe. Um, but I think the more basic idea is that our phones are probably not good for us. I think our phones, if you were being honest, makes it a lot easier to fall in, fall in love with the things of this world. Pastor Matt Chandler once said that our love and addiction for technology is making us an angry, impatient people. I think we would all agree with that. And I think the deeper question you need to ask yourself is should you get rid of your smartphone? And my my answer to that is maybe. 
1 John 2 tells us, do not love the things of this world or the things in this world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him because all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the arrogance produced by material things is not from the Father, but it's from the world. See, the challenge for us as believers is twofold. The first challenge is, is eternal, internal. Where, where it's the struggle of every day, you wake up to renew your mind, renew your heart, submit your life to Christ, be led by the Holy Spirit day in and day out, not loving anything more than your relationship with Christ, moment by moment being led by him. My fear as your pastor is that your iPhone doesn't help with this. And then the second is external. That's removing things from your life, placing guardrails around your life to help you stay away from sin. I avoid the strip club not out of legalism, but out of wisdom, ladies and gentlemen. Because, because the reality is, I can sit here and say, well, I'm going to the strip club to witness, and I'll witness something, but it probably won't be Jesus. And we put guardrails around our lives. I believe all believers should think long and hard about all forms of technology, because not because technology, technology is bad, but because your heart is currently not strong enough to deal with it. One of my uh, good buddies, um, uh, someone I look up to highly, um, lived many years of his life in alcoholism. Um, and then in God's grace and God's sovereignty, he took it away from him. Uh, and, and now he jokes, I used to go into a bar to get drunk. Now I go into a bar to pick up dudes for the gospel. And you sinners were thinking the wrong thing. Um, and for him and his own heart, because of what God has done in his heart and because of what God has done in his mind, he can go into those environments and preach the gospel and live out the gospel because of the goodness of Jesus. I have other friends, because God hasn't done that in their heart yet and hasn't done that in their minds yet, it is not a safe environment for them to go into. And they have to place guardrails in place until God does it. God gets the glory in a miracle and can instantly pull it away. And God gets the glory in the maintenance, the daily struggle to flee from those sins. Why does God give the glory in someone getting a miracle and someone getting the maintenance? I do not know. Why does God give a talent to, 10 talents to one person and one talent to another? I do not know. But the reality that I do know is that all of us should think long and hard about the amount of time we spend on these devices and how beneficial they actually are to our lives. So to answer your question, is it the mark of the beast? Probably not. Is it good for your soul? Mm, probably something you should sincerely, sincerely pray for and pray about. Great question. Uh, question number uh, four. Um, this is an even better question. A question that you may have never known or ever thought about. Why did God want to kill Moses? And you're right sitting here going, Moses? Like, wait, what? God wanted to kill Moses? If God wanted to kill Moses and it was like, Moses, like, what chance do I have? Uh, and so, like, it's, it's only like two, uh, two to three verses. Um, Exodus chapter 4, verses 24 through 26 uh, and it says this, now on the way at the place where they stopped for the night, the Lord met Moses and sought to kill him. Uh, but Sephora took a flint knife. This is such a weird, weird story um, because we don't understand the culture. But Sephora took a flint knife, cut off the foreskin of her son, and touched it to Moses' feet and said, surely you are the bridegroom of blood to me. So the, the Lord let him alone, left him alone the moment she did this. <laughs> it's a weird story. Um, but I established earlier, remember we talked about this earlier, God chose Abraham, made a covenant with Abraham to create this great nation, the Israelite nation. And one of the signs of this nation is to be holy would be that of circumcision. Why 
I don't, I don't understand it. I mean, they wore clothes back then. Like, so what did you just walk around and be like, hey, I'm, uh, I'm an Israelite. Like, it's, it's weird. Like, right? Now that you think about it, that's a strange thing. Super strange thing. Um, but regardless of it, that was the standard in which God set. And so then at this point in time, Genesis 17, God establishes this standard. Um, And then in in, in 17, 14, God says, any uncircumcised male who has not been circumcised in the flesh uh, of his foreskin will be cut off from his people. He has failed to carry out my requirements. Now, fast forward. Moses is now going to be the leader of this people. They're in bondage. They're in slavery. And so God has chosen Moses to lead the people out of slavery, out of bondage, to be different, set apart, and holy. And so now Moses is leaving to go do this. God has called him to be a nation of holiness, to lead this nation, to be set apart. But yet we see in verses 26, 40, 24 through 26, that Moses didn't even lead his own family. How in the world is he going to lead an entire nation when he can't even lead his home? Some scholars and most scholars believe that Sephora from the area in which she came from, from who her father is, that she actually probably most likely was from a pagan nation. He married a a, a pagan woman who didn't understand the concepts of their their religion. But because of Moses leading, they became Israelites and, and different things like this. But there's a high possibility that at some point in time, Sephora would look at it and go, well, that's strange. That's not how my custom does it. And Moses compromised. Regardless if we know Sephora said this or not, because we don't, and we're just inferring and reading into it, the regardless, the re, regardless of the fact, we do know that Moses was the one who was called to be the leader of a nation who was set apart and set different, holy. But he compromised on even the smallest things in his own home. And his own wife, his wife, had to cover his sin. God takes leadership very seriously, men. Very seriously. Fast forward to the church today. When God calls for elders and pastors to be leaders of the church in this, he challenges us. 1 Timothy chapter 3. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him. And he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. Because if anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? God takes leadership seriously. See, because God knew that at this moment in this time, if Moses were to compromise on this, for the next 40, 50 years of leading the Israelite people, he would have compromised and compromised and compromised. Why did he set the standard at circumcision? I don't know. It's weird. When we get to heaven, we can ask. But the reality is, he sets the standards. We don't. We don't get to look at it and go, well, I don't like that. I'm supposed to be loving and kind? I don't really like that. Do you know my boss? He's awful, so I'm not going to be loving and kind to him. You don't get to set the standards. He does. And for us as believers, we just live to his standards. And us as men, we lead our families to those standards. Men, stop compromising. Stop compromising in your households. Stop compromising with your children. Lead them to holiness because that's the standard in which God has set, and that's the standard he expects you to lead by. He takes it very seriously. Whew, Father's Day is fun. Uh, All right, um, because this is going to lead me to the next two questions, and I want you to actually hear these questions. We're going to read them in tandem. Um, the first one, uh, most sermons um, I've heard, uh, verses I have read about families all seem to focus on there being a father and a mother uh, and what their role should be. Just spoke about that. 
Um, is there anywhere uh, to reference when there is only one parent in the home? This is a great question, and it kind of ties in with the next one, and it's because both of them struggle or deal with the struggle of overcoming being a single parent or being the only parent in the household who has faith. Uh, so let me read the next question as well. <clears throat> what are some words of encouragement to single mothers who feel like they already carry the world on their shoulders and feel like they're not doing enough for their children and their spiritual health. Church, I want us to hear the struggle in this. I, I'm going to answer it, but I want us to rest in the moment of what this question was just asked. And may it challenge your hearts. And regardless if you're a mom or a dad with an unbelieving spouse, which we have in our church, or you're raising your child alone, I want to give you one verse of encouragement. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5 states this. I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. See, Paul was talking to Timothy. He is now a pastor of a church, and one of Paul's uh, closest friends. And so First and Second Timothy are written. Uh, Paul is in jail. He is writing encouragement to Timothy, who is a young guy who is trying to figure out how to lead a bunch of broken, jacked up people. And so he's giving him this encouragement and, 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 and telling him, and he is excited. Paul is saying, I am excited for the faith, Timothy, that you hold to, knowing that you uh, learned this from bo both your mother and your grandmother. And, 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 and pause and hear me in this, mothers. This speaks volumes to you as moms about how much you can actually speak into the lives of your boys. Take comfort in this passage. There's no indication that Timothy's dad was in the picture. Um, some scholars believe he died. Some scholars believe he didn't stick around. Some scholars believe that he uh, was just lost and a lost person in a household. We don't know those answers. But we do know this. From this passage, he didn't have faith. Take it another layer. Take it another step. We also know that his granddad was either dead, not in the picture, or didn't have faith. Regardless, Timothy's life, Timothy's mother's life, was changed because one parent made a decision. Timothy's grandmother made a decision. I'm not going to compromise. I'm going to live out the faith. I'm going to proclaim the truth. I'm going to proclaim the gospel. I'm going to raise my daughter in the faith. And as he raised, she raised his, her daughter in the faith, that daughter then <laughs> raises her son in the faith. And the beautiful thing about this passage is that right now we know Timothy was a generational curse breaker. That for two generations, Timothy's dad and Timothy's granddad, we don't know how, but for some reason we do know, did not have faith. And because a grandmother stood up, and because a mother stood up, a son is now a pastor, breaking the generation and leading more and more people to know Christ. Take comfort in these words, single parents. Take comfort in this, that nothing is lost when God places his hand on it. Now, is God's design for a husband and wife to lead their children uh, to biblical worldviews? Yes, of course. But just because it's the standard doesn't mean God doesn't bless everything else. And I know you feel like the world is on your shoulders. I know you feel like you're doing the job of two. And I am so sorry. But let this verse bring you hope. That word for sincere faith, that, that word for sincere, the Greek actually means undisguised, not pretended, genuine. Please, because hear me in this. It's about, qual it's about quality not quantity. 
Just because you have a husband and a wife in the home doesn't guarantee you have a God-centered home. What guarantees a God-centered home is God-centered parents, if it be one or two. For Timothy, his life was changed because one parent lived a genuine, unpersuaded, uh, undisguised life. The Bible tells us to train our child in the ways that they should go. And I believe too many Christians are training their children to think about Jesus on Sunday, but not allow Jesus to impact them the rest of the week. And I know you're tired. Single mom, I know you're tired. Single dad, I know you're tired. But there is nothing wrong with being tired. Use that. Don't hide it. Don't act. Don't tell your children that you got it all together because you don't got it all together. Use that and let your children see you in your weakness so that they can see how God works within your weakness. 2 Corinthians 12 tells us, My grace is enough for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. So then I will boast more gladly about my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may reside in me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, with insult, with troubles, with persecutions and difficulties for the sake of Christ, that whenever I am weak in Christ, I then am strong. For all parents out there, raising kids is hard. We, um, we picked up my three oldest, spent the night at my mom's house. It's not in my notes, but it doesn't matter. Um, picked them up in my mom's house when we were uh, having to go to a birthday party and uh, afterwards, and uh, we went to the birthday party, and London wanted to stay uh, at my parents' house because she didn't want to go to the birthday party, so we had to come back and pick up London. And, um, and as we got back from the birthday party, my mom goes, oh, I did not think they were going to make it. Uh, I was just getting sass from our kids. Uh, and um, anyone else get sass from your, you are looking at me like blank stares, like we've never gotten sass before, you liars. Uh, and uh, and Brit, my mom was just like, I, I am shocked they make it. And Brittany was like, oh, yeah, we about killed them right before we got in the car. Like, like it's real. Being parents is hard. Loving our children is difficult. Um, and trying to walk them in the gospel is hard. And, you know, Brittany and I, um, as we're getting to, to circle up that story that I just shared, um, you know, we, we get in the car, and Brittany's frustrated because it's hot, you know, and trying to get the kids and getting all the kids in the car and get, make sure everyone has their swimmies and this and this and all this stuff. And she gets in the car, and she just sits down, and she's just like, Ugh. She's like, I'm not mad. I'm just super frustrated, girls. Like, re- it's hot. I'm frustrated. And I got to look at our uh, three of our girls. Again, London was with my parents. And I said, girls, you have a wonderful opportunity right now. Your mom's frustrated. And we have the wonderful joy of watching how the Holy Spirit works in her life. And I would encourage you, girls, like pray for your mom right now. Spend some moments. Think through your words to encourage her and lift her up in this frustrated time as I will think of how to love my wife through this difficult time. And in the moment of our weakness, we were able to boast about our Christ. Parents, I would encourage you to do all parents, single or not, use this. If you have kids who are older and moved out, please hear me. It's not too late. It is not too late. God is calling and telling you that it is not too late. This is, you know, the funny thing is, I say that joke every single time the phone rings, and you laugh every single time. <laughs> um, it's so funny. Um, uh, but the reality is it's not too late. If your children are moved out and grown and moved on, it is not too late. Can I encourage you? Maybe, maybe take them to lunch. Buy them lunch, especially if they're, like, in their early 20s and they're hungry because they're poor right now. Um, buy them a good steak. And sit them down and apologize. Apologize to them and say, I didn't lead well. 
I didn't understand what it meant to be a godly dad or a godly mom. I went to church, but I didn't get it. But I get it now. And I know it's, I know I'm out of the house, but the reality is you're out of the house. I'm going to love you the best that I possibly can and lead the best that I possibly can in this new stage. I would challenge you, see how it changes the game. And then love your grandkids to the gospel and encourage them to the gospel. It's never too late. If you're still breathing, God's not done with you. Amen? Amen. And so um, last question and uh, we are done. Um, What's your thoughts on my theory that today's racial tension is a direct result of the Tower of Babel? Um, I think the answer is yes and no. Um, because the result of racism in this world, and let's just be very clear, it's in the world, not just the United States. Don't let the media lie to you that we are a cesspool of evil-filled, racist, bigoted people um, who hate everyone because of their skin color. Don't get me wrong. Our country has racism in it, uh, but that's due to sin, period. This is a sin issue, Period. Our world is filled with sinners. The whole reason for the Tower of Babel is because of sin. The story is Genesis chapter 11. People are sinners. So do I believe it's a direct result of Babel? I mean, the nations were divided. But racism is here because sin is here. Let me end with the words of Jesus. Matthew chapter 12, verse 25 says this. Now when Jesus realized what they were thinking, he said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is destroyed, and no town or house divided against itself will stand. Now, now there's a larger reason why Jesus is saying this, and I would encourage you to go home and read this passage and, and find that out, but the principles are still true here. And I don't know about you, but as I watch the news, and as I listen to this and listen to that and read Twitter and all this stuff, someone's doing a really good job trying to divide us. And I personally believe, I personally believe it's the church's job to bring healing. We are not called to be activists, church. We are called to be evangelists. And I believe passing more laws, electing more officials, more riots, and more marches are not the answer. I truly believe the only way racism in this culture, the only way this land will be healed is when God's people stand up, first driving the sin out of their own life, and then stand up and proclaim the truth that Jesus is the only way and the only answer. And I believe it has to start with us. It has to start with each and every one of us. Churches need to stand up and start calling out phony Christians who proclaim Christ out of one mouth and make an off-color remark out of the other. We as believers need to start being the light that God has called us to be. We need to quit trying to put filters to dim our brightness. We just need to be the light. In our, not our country, not a country of divide, division, but a country submitted to the word of God. A country anointed by the Holy Spirit. And it starts in here and flows out there. So I ask, what area of your life is unsubmitted? What area of your life are you holding on to your sin? Bitterness, wounds, hurts, insecurities. What area of your life, not just racism, because I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a race problem because we are one race, the human race. It's a sin problem. What sin in your life right now are you holding on to that you need to let go of and move past and be the light, to be the salt that God has called you to be? Church, it starts with us. Because I believe if it starts with us and we remove the sin from our lives, we're going to cross, cross the aisle. It starts with us and we're loving and we're kind 
patient, we start to live out the fruits of the Spirit, the world will look at us just like they did thousands of years ago and said, that, that nation, those people, there's something different about them. And we have the wonderful joy and girls, there is. His name is Jesus. Let me pray for us.